tonight, I'll introduce uh, Lieutenant uh, Commander Alex Scott. He is a uh, former U.S. Army uh, H-860 medevac pilot. He's got a deployment to Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, he grew up uh, in aviation, in general aviation, before he became a military pilot. Uh, like myself, um, we got our ratings and our experience together in Florida when we were in college at Embry-Riddle. And then he went on and joined Army ROTC. Uh, he later recruited me in Army ROTC and into helicopters because I was fascinated by helicopters. And um, he graduated in 2004, commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Medical Service Corps and flew the uh, medevac uh, Black Hawks. And uh, then about uh, 10 years ago, he joined the U.S. Coast Guard. And I will say one thing uh, from a from the standpoint as a uh, H-64 pilot, um, when the ground guys are in trouble, they want two people. They want attack coverage and they want medevac coverage. And I had the advantage whenever I was in Afghanistan responding to troops in contact with uh, ground forces getting shot at of having a 30 millimeter cannon, Hellfire missiles and rockets. But the medevac guys go into hot LZs with the simple sidearm that they're issued, they can't carry weapons. So in my opinion, the medevac pilots are some true, true heroes. And that's Alex. And he's still a hero out there uh, trying to protect people uh, by serving in the Coast Guard. So it is my distinct honor to uh, introduce my mentor, my friend, and uh, very respected aviator, uh, Lieutenant Commander Alex Scott. Alex, you have the flight controls. Hey, good evening, Jeremy, and uh, I have the controls. Hey, you got the controls. And, uh, <laughs> thanks. Hey, everybody. Uh, real honor to be here tonight. Big thanks to Jeremy and Paul for inviting me to do this uh, to do this, this presentation. Uh, I'm gonna pop up the screen here real quick. And we are going to be discussing tonight special VFR aeronautical decision making, or as I like to call, running the scud. Um, that is actually, and that is not an encouraging term. That is a very derogatory term, in fact. Uh, why am I here presenting this tonight? For about five years uh, of my career, I guess I live in Pacific Northwest and flying with the Coast Guard. Uh, up to that point, and we're talking somewhere around mark ballpark of 12 years of aviation experience, I could recite special VFR, I could talk to you about 91155, and all of those, all of the regulations, no problem at all. But I, thinking about it, I'd never actually requested special VFR until I got to Pacific Northwest um, up there where it's very remote, no radar coverage, even fewer uh, instrument approaches, uh, and controlled, certain controlled airport services. So we're going to talk about this tonight and figure out, uh, and give you figure out and develop the tools for all of you pilots out there, how to use special VFR and also more importantly when not to. Which uh, if you ever hear yourself say running the scud, I'll give you a hint. That's probably one of them. All right, real quick on our agenda. While we're talking tonight, I ask if you guys have a tablet in front of you or you have the paper far in, you pull it out and you start reading. Uh, and just follow along a little bit. This is not meant to be an academic discussion of 91 point of the 91 uh, FARs. This is uh, we're going to be discussing loosely on top of them, but most of us here are pilots or are, are well versed students. I want you guys to go ahead and uh, and refresh yourselves in the actual academics of that. So part of the agenda, and we are to start up on the introduction, but we're really going to talk a lot about why are we here how does special VFR work, what affects it, when we can use it, when we should not use it, and then also talking about alternatives and risk mitigation strategies. And then we're also going to discuss some scenarios. With that, one of my big things that I'm, I'm very concerned about in today's aviation, and uh, this, uh, there's other, I know there's probably a few other people from military out here, and there's probably some more uh, safety representatives as well. One thing that we have really pushed on in the last few years, in the, in the Coast Guard especially, uh, is a, a term known as just culture. And this is a, it's a radical mindset in a way, uh, it's common sense, but it's also a little bit radical in that we should be willing to discuss our mistakes. And similarly, we should not be fearing reprisal on our mistakes as well either. So tonight, what you're gonna hear from me is some of these times where I've used special VFR both wisely and also uh, not wisely. 
And I ask you guys, if anyone you want to put comments in the bottom, say, hey, I've been through this before, or you want to discuss something, please feel free to speak up. We cannot learn and improve our safety culture if we are not willing to learn about it and study what's getting us hurt or killed. Understand? All right, so who am I? So Jeremy gave me a pretty good introduction there. I don't know if I want to beat it down anymore, but uh, I am, yeah, I'm a Coast Guard helicopter pilot. I've been flying in uh, civil, civil and military aviation for about 20 plus years, a little over 3,000 hours. Uh, ATP, CFII, um, started out flying airplanes, the little Cessnas like everybody else. Uh, found my way into helicopters through a lot of sweeping floors and a lot of waiting tables. Uh, Found myself in the Army after 9-11, uh, flying medevac, one of the greatest jobs ever had, hands down. And for the last nine years, I've been serving in the Coast Guard, where I've had amazing opportunities to flying everything from search and rescue to environmental patrols to, law, to uh, tactical law enforcement, and even doing instructing, examining, and then as of late, being a production test pilot here at Elizabeth City. With that, though, I just want to make everyone understand, yes, I'm in the Coast Guard. Uh, however, this is me as a, tonight I'm speaking as a, as a fellow general aviation pilot. And you see my little comment down at the bottom of my, of my slideshow. This uh, is my presentation. This is not an official documented thing from the FAA, from the U.S. Coast Guard, or, uh, or anything produced by the FAST. So these are my opinions and my opinions only. All right, so why are we here, guys? All right. Uh, if you'll notice on my slides, I have a little, I have a little silly quote up at top. Um, I'd like to say it's silly, but these are all comments I've heard throughout the flight, throughout my flights that have usually gotten me into some kind of trouble, or I've had to really think fast on my, fast on my, in my harness. Uh, similarly, I've put down below, uh, I've put sources. Everything you'll see here tonight comes from a source. Uh, I, I don't believe in uh, making up terms, and I also believe that you guys should be able to look up and find things on your own as well. Additionally, you're gonna see some pictures on the right-hand side of the screen on some of these slides. These are all flight conditions I've flown in and I was either in the cockpit at the time of this or I was in the other aircraft uh, when these photos were taken, uh, except for the last picture and that you'll understand why and you see that one. But why are we here? If you've taken a second, you've seen that we have some of these, uh, you see some of these statistics. These are actually not all from one particular study. These are from three or four different studies from the last 20 years uh, from the FAA, the NTSB and also from University of Purdue. Uh, we uh, unintended entry into inadvertent IMC into IMC conditions and inadvertent IMC, whatever you want to call it. This is a major issue in aviation uh, right now. Loss of control and flight, loss of and uh, controlled flight into terrain are the are the top two causes of, go of general aviation accidents. By the way, they're also forty percent of them, of which ninety five percent are fatal. So we are doing this to ourselves. Two major points I want to highlight on this: Who's doing it? Eighty two percent of the flights in one study were. Uh, Air, or single engine airplanes. And of that same study, 73% of the pilots knowingly took off with these conditions. So this is something we are doing to ourselves. We do not need to do it ourselves. And it's having um, a traumatic effect throughout our, throughout our culture. Um, more closer to home as a helicopter pilot, uh, you look right down at the bottom quote there. I think that should be very telling. Even a well-trained helicopter pilot experiencing inadvertent IMC has an average lifespan of 60 seconds. So why are we here tonight? No, it's not to rehash what happened to Kobe Bryant and that helicopter crew. Um, as that information developed, there's a lot of decisions that were made that we can go back and forth on. But this is something that's happened a lot more. Uh, right now, the goal of the, the United States helicopter safety team is to have an accident rate of just 0.55% out of every 100,000 flight hours and have zero fatalities. And I believe this year we rounded out about 19 fatalities. So we got a long way to go. Uh, general aviation, it's all over the map. All right, so special VFR ins and outs. Now, once again, I promised you we, this would not be a, a lecture discussion on um, FAR part 91. However, let's get a little bit more outside the box on what we're talking about in regards to where special VFR is affected. And let's start right at the beginning, 91.103. This FAR is, is, the, is the guideline, pre-flight action. And right there, if you look under um, subparagraph A, the FAA is, is pretty much telling you, if you're not sticking really local, you probably should be looking at all the different conditions necessary for your flight, especially, wet, especially with weather in there, weather reports and forecasts, fuel requirements and alternatives available. So if the flight cannot be completed, little hint there. 
So something to think about, right? Before you even go, why, are, if you have any kind of uh, obscuration in the sky, why are you going? What are you doing? Where are you thinking about this? Where can you go? And next, that goes another one. Uh, when I was a younger pilot and we didn't have all the cool tools that we have out today, I can't tell you how many times as a new private pilot, I'd go flying with a buddy and we hear, we see some weather coming in, like it'd be four miles and 1200 feet or something crazy, or it'd be, you know, you see a a, a, a METAR at a class G airport and it'd say it's 905. And I invariably, and I'm sure I even said it too, was, hey, oh, we're gonna, be, we're gonna do some scud running today. Well, what are we doing? Where are we flying? Uh, 119er talks about flights over congested areas. Granted, you know, arriving and departing an airport, but how low, how low, or how long are you going to fly and how, and how low? If you can't get out, if you can't climb above to a safe altitude departing an airport, where are you going to? Some things to think about. All right. Now to the meat and potatoes, little 91157 talk, just as I, uh, as I promised here. But basically, this is the excerpt from uh, the bottom portion of 91155. The FAA has done a tremendous job. In one hand, they're saying, we want you to fly per 91.155, visual flight, then visual flight rules based on all the different classes of airspace, right? So, however, in, a more, in, an even no, in another swift move, they also said, you know what? We understand there are going to be times where that may, where that may not be the most prudent option for you. So we're going to allow special VFR flight requirements to fly in, in an airport that is no, that is set for IFR, that is set for IFR. Um, be very careful with that though. Uh, for most of us, who, for most people in here, I'm assuming are not helicopter pilots or air, who fly airplanes. Look at that middle section. Uh, it talks about a uh, person being granted ATC clearance must meet the applicable requirements per part 61 and also fly an aircraft that's, e that's equipped per 91.5. 205. What is 91.205D, you ask? That's your, that's your equipment for instrument flight rules. So if you are a purely VFR pilot uh, or pure private pilot and you fly a purely uh, VFR aircraft, let's say it's a uh, light sport or it's an older Cessna 152, the very fact you might be thinking about scud running or special VFR should put yourself um, into a question mark. All right. Now, how do we come up with these determinations. What is in-flight visit? What's our, how is our weather observed? Not going to beat a dead horse here. I'm sure all of you know how to read a TAF, know how to read a METAR, know how to read surface analysis, know how to pull your weather from your, from your tablets or your electronic flight bags. Um, good on you. But how does that system work? Well, it's, it, all, the air, uh, all our weather observations come off of uh, prevailing visibility and ceilings, not necessarily an average. If you've ever flown in a really foggy in region uh, or an area that's prone to bad weather, uh, like I have, it's not uncommon to see half the airport covered in fog and the other half of the airport is 10 miles and clear. And you may, at one point in time in that same spot, it may say, you know, 10 miles and clear and you're sitting in a fog bank. Another time that may say you're half mile, half mile fog with vertical visibility 100 feet and you're sitting on the, run you're sitting on the runway looking at blue sky. So understanding how that system works, shooting all up to 12,000 feet, and then in the vicinity, five to 10 miles from the airport, those uh, observation systems and those, and those weather observers are making a generalization on the weather. So it's incumbent upon you to know where you're flying to, know your routes of flight, know what's going on. Uh, similarly, and this is one that we harped on a lot, I got my cursor here, uh, this bottom tab, all right, rule of thumb. So you live and die by this on the west coast. It's if your temperature dew point spreads less than three degrees Celsius, your conditions are conducive to fog. It's not just fog, however, anytime it's been there, you're, you're pretty much betting on having some kind of weather and weather event come through, whether it be haze, mist, fog itself, low lying clouds. That's one uh, great example tonight. I'm here in beautiful Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And it was at 6.30, it was uh, like four miles scattered clouds at 500 feet. It's now low IFR with three miles uh, uh, overcast at, five, at 400. So once again, prevailing visibility has changed, right? Because it's just an observation. So 
that is where you really need to watch out for if you're planning on using a special VFR as a way to transit in and out of an airport. All right, here's my favorite tool. And I think this is something that can't be understated stated enough. Weather depiction. Back in the day, we had the weather depiction charts, which uh, if you remember, you log into aviationweather.gov and you get this little black and white thing with a lot of dots all over it. And you had some uh, squiggly lines everywhere. And that told you your areas of marginal VFR, your areas of IFR. And in some cases, you're really lucky as it got more advanced, you got a subset of IFR, which was the low IFR conditions, which you have there on the left. Um, these, this was great because if I was knowing I was flying in a certain region, like on the sectional, the, uh, the sectional area below, I could say, hey, I know, hey, I might have some weather up to the north and maybe to the west, but it looks like I might be in a good flight condition area to the south and east. So right, right off the bat, when before we had all this, all these uh, streaming and up to the minute weather reporting tools, like our, like for example, an EF, like an EFB, you had this way of saying, hey, maybe I can or I cannot fly. Very powerful stuff. This is I use this every time I go and fly. I'll take a quick look over what the what how the weather colors are depicted, and then I'll go more in depth in my routing. But right away I can tell if it's not going to be a good idea to go or not. All right, so you're leaning towards uh, requesting special VFR. All right, first off, I want you to have I want you to take a look at that quote I put up top. It says in a one two three Alpha Bravo local tower field is IFR state intentions. You do not want to have that conversation with, with air traffic control unless you already have a plan to use, use the system or the service. This is ideally you've already checked ATIS and you're knowingly asking, once again, the FAA has recognized that you, there may be times where you need to, it may be better for you to fly visually than to go up and receive an instrument clearance and shoot an instrument approach in. What is your intention? What are you trying to do? So you should probably have that plan before you even take off or before you get close to that airspace, right? So right on the top and the bottom, special VFR, it can be used for entering, departing, or transitioning the surface or controlled airspace, right? That is the intent, mostly going in, trans, mostly entering or departing controlled surface airspace. I want that to be, I want that to be understood. It's not meant for you to go out and have a joy flight in that airspace, because once you Quest special VFR and your takeoff is granted or your permission to depart or enter is granted, you remember you're in an IFR environment. Yes, you're flying visually, but you're in an IFR environment, which means that you're holding up traffic for anybody else that's going in or out there. Conversely, you trying to come back in, you're going to be held up by somebody trying to go in or out. It's not like a typical flying around the pattern at an airport. They're not going to let you. Uh, in fact, even flying in a helicopter uh, in, Ar in Arcata, California, even done in Jacksonville, Florida, just doing traffic pattern work because our limits are, you know, the traffic pattern was, you know, we'd fly at 500 feet and it was a low ceiling, seven to 800 feet. We would be told to land or get below 10 feet hovering by tower or traffic control so they could bring other aircraft in, even if we weren't operating anywhere near there. And that's how sensitive the system is. Um, similarly, no, uh, while the FAA does recognize it, uh, and per their own manuals, they cannot, rec air traffic control cannot recommend this clearance. So this is entirely on you as a pilot in command to make that call. Um, remember, you have, you typically want to be flying an aircraft that's IFR equipped, typically not in all cases, there's exceptions, obviously. Uh, but once again, predominant, prevailing, uh, visibility and ceiling are not disrupted to the flight path. So if you're on that ramp or you're out or you're flying somewhere on it off of an airport and you look and you try to go and you say hey there's a big wall of cloud in my way chances are you're not that's not going to disappear when you're going into and out so can you maintain vfr or maintain uh, vmc conditions throughout the route of special vfr things to think about there uh ideally and this is my rule of thumb this is a personal alex scott one if you're going to be using special vfr you should be typically going to land or you should be going into a VFR environment, i.e. this should only be a temporary thing. If you're flying in constant IFR and you're just trying to scud run, and I've said that a few times now, you're, you're wrong, uh, frankly. Um, you're putting yourself at a lot of risk. You're putting people on the ground at risk and you're putting yourself, you're boxing yourself into a corner where you don't have instrument clearance, you are not prepared for it and chances are 
you're, you don't have your aircraft set up properly. Um, one, another uh, situation, this is more of a serious one, is what the environment's not conducive to IFR operations. And this has happened to me, where you start flying and let's say it's winter time, you know, not to throw out a, a bad TV show quote, but winter is coming, right? Freezing levels come down. Uh, you still have to hit your final approach fixes and your initial approach fixes to shoot instrument approaches. Well, if it just so happens that that freezing level drops below and there's, in your, and there's low clouds, you may or may not be able to climb up there depending on the capabilities of your aircraft. My current helicopter does not have anti-ice capability. And I'll tell you, there's a number of times, especially around January uh, in Humboldt Bay, California, where we could not get the instrument approach, uh, the ILS back into back in there because late in the day, early in the morning, that freezing level was right around a thousand feet. And the final approach fix, final approach fix was at 1,400. Oh, and by the way, it's a non-radar environment. So for us, we use uh, pre-established low visibility routes and special VFR to get in and out, especially for, especially for cases. Um, however, you also wanna make sure your planned fuel. It's great to say, hey, my in route fuel is two hours, I have. But remember that if you're flying into a special VFR air, or an IFR airport, and you're trying to request special VFR and there's other aircraft coming in, especially airliners, and they're already talking to tower and talking to approach and getting their approach clearances, you're going to have to take a, a, not take a spot in line. You will not be the, uh, you will not be where you think you want to be. And in fact, not to throw, not to rehash old things, the crash, uh, that Kobe Bryant crash in Southern California, for example, he was orbiting for 12 minutes before he was even cl cleared in. And that's actually when they lost him. So you, you know, particularly when you're flying a Cessna or a Piper, you have lots of fuel unless you're on an extended cross country. A helicopter is obviously not so much. This can box you into a corner where you may have, to, you may be in a situation to declare minimum fuel or you're putting yourself in an emergency situation that, hey, why did you even fly in the first place? What was the purpose of the mission? All right. So talk about that this is a blow up of that of that previous sectional and some things i kind of want to show you guys here is take a look at this and uh, i'm curious I, I want you i want you all to think about this as we're uh, as i'm talking here and let's talk about some scenarios so you are we can put it to a better color did not work out so well so let's say then this is a right area between Greensboro, North Carolina and Charlotte. So beautiful area, it's slightly hilly. Um, you can see there your maximum elevation figures, you have a 2000, 2800 there, you have some high towers in this area. Lots of small, lots of airports with weather reporting and a, even and a lot more airports without, right? And this particular day you're looking and you see, hey, the main airports are reporting IFR uh, to the north, to the, uh, and the south and east is either a low IFR or a, or a marginal VFR situation, which is still VFR, but you're kind of running on that fringe, right? So let's talk about some scenarios. Let's say you're in this airport right here, and you want to go up here, um, just outside of, uh, outside of Greensboro. All right. What are you thinking about on this one? I mean, first off always, what's the purpose of your flight? Are you flying here to get the $100 hamburger? Uh, are you bringing your aircraft in for maintenance? Are you on an angel flight? Uh, are you a EMS operator and you're doing a part 135 hop? Or are you moving an EMS aircraft, let's say under part 91? Uh, sky's the limit here, right? So what are you trying to do? You already know the field's IFR. So what are you thinking about? What, is, what does that IFR mean? Is it, is it 10 miles and overcast at 900 feet? Is it three miles overcast at 500 feet? Broken at two, broken at 300 feet. What's, what is that decision for you? You're starting out a class G airport, so you're more than likely already, your VFR is already in an interesting situation, right? Although with weather depiction, it already, you already guarantee that it's telling you that this is greater than three mile, um, excuse me, greater than three miles of or you're up above five miles visibility and greater than 3000 foot ceilings per weather depiction. So right away, you've got, you know, you're in a pretty good spot flying around here, but now, you know, you're going to be in a lower spot. Conversely, let's talk about this. 
what if I, hey, I'm starting out this class D and I need to transit back to here? What could be my problems? Um, you know, hey, I'm, I'm requesting a special VFR. Let's say it's, you know, let's, let's give that January scenario where it's a low ceiling and you don't want to fly, file IFR to fly 12 miles. Uh, you know, special VFR might be more conducive to you or more enticing, I'll say. And you want to depart out of, you decide you want to depart out of here. Uh, on a special V. Well, where are you going? Well, you said we already know you're going you're going into a known VFR area by weather depiction. Um, however, what's the forecast? Is this gonna is this gonna follow? It's a little bit scary to think you have a low IFR, you have IFR around you, and maybe some marginal. So which way is this system moving? Is it moving from the north to the south? Is it moving west uh, from the south up? And these just got caught in the hills. What's going on there? I want some things to think about. And then, oh yeah, by the way, uh, this little guy, uh, I'm, I'm contrary to the popular joke, definitely worry about that little guy. Why is he going low IFR and this guy's, this guy's showing VFR and all, everybody else has some kind of obscuration, right? So with that, when would you not go to VF, special VFR? And I wanna talk about some of that. Right there, you, so you got four question marks. What do you all think? Uh, I can't see the comments right now, but I'd be, what do you all think? Put some, please put some comments in there. When would or would you not? I'm kind of curious on that one. For me, prevailing IFR conditions through the route of flight. If I know I'm taking off and I'm going to be dealing with, with IFR conditions, the whole entire route of flight, regardless of going into class G and changing over to just by, just by a nature of a regulation change, do you necessarily want to continue on, maybe you're going to another airport that is also in, in a special is, in, is currently the field is IFR. What are you trying to do? Where are you, where are you going? Um, also, what is the weather reporting in that area? Uh, we talk about unknown weather conditions. What if you're flying and we'll go back one here. Okay, let's say you're here and you wanna fly to here. Now it's an approximate. You know, I'll make that a little better for you. So you want to you want to fly up here, and you want to come all the way down to here. Well, now you're flying to an unknown. You got marginal. You got IFR. What what is your plan? Uh, are you gonna have a flight plan filed? Do you have any ideas on what your on what your fuel requirements should be? What is once again? What are you trying to do, and why are you doing it? Uh, Similarly enough, a lot of us fly aircraft and a lot of us, especially on the, on the general aviation side, we like to fly aircraft when it's beautiful outside. How familiar are you with your aircraft and its systems? How many of you as single pilots, let's say it goes really, the weather is really, uh, the term I like to use skosh, and you decide to, how fast, how many of you think you could transition from flying entirely visually to firing up that VOR or firing up or, uh, or firing up the uh, GPS, if you will, that's been sitting in that, that's been sitting in that dash for who knows how long and setting yourself up for an instrument approach or getting yourself up with air, uh, air traffic control and requesting a clearance. Um, it's another question. How many of you have ever actually had to do a quote unquote pickup clearance or requesting an IFR clearance from directly from air traffic control? They will do it and they are very helpful, but how much were you going to be flying to into this? Can you maintain your visual flight conditions? Are you just going to say, ah, I just I hit the believe button and hit the clouds? That is something that's going to that can happen if you're not familiar with the aircraft. When's the last time you had your VOR calibrated? Uh, you know, more, more and more of these things start, oh, that onion starts on unraveling itself and you start seeing a lot more issues. Um, similarly, in operating equipment, when's the last time your database was updated in your GPS? Uh, that placard doesn't automatically come off when that placarded VOR or, or NDB or ADF receiver doesn't magically come off in a flight just because, and you say, oh, I have, I meet 91.205D. No, you do not. So what is your, what are you planning on doing? And then this is my big one, purpose of flight. And I will be honest with you, once again, I'm talking about just culture. This is an area where I have made a lot of mistakes in my, in my aviation career. A what is the purpose? Are you doing a training flight? Are you doing a mission? Are you being, are you hired to do sightseeing? What is your purpose of your flight? And is it really worth risking a hundred dollar hamburger to fly in 
in bad conditions or conditions that have a limited viewpoint. Understanding full effect, you're not the only pilot out there that's also having these same thoughts and are they as ready and equipped? And once again, how, much, how worth it is it to say, I got to run the SCUD? Okay, so I did tell you guys about my just culture uh, philosophy and how I believe it needs, it needs to only, it's, in, it's out there and needs to only be expanded in my opinion. But I want you to take a look here. So this is Northern California, uh, about 80 miles south of Oregon. This is Humboldt Bay, California, arguably one of the most beautiful, uh, most dynamic and most challenging flight regions in the world. Uh, Arcata, California, which is now called the California Redwood Coast, Humboldt County Airport, um, is it competes with some part of London, England for the foggiest place on earth. Similarly, the first instrument landing system or ILS was installed here back in the day because this area, and it was also a fog, wet, a fog research station. So needless to say, this is an area um, just like a lot of the West Coast is that's prone to really bad weather and it shows up fast and quick. Uh, and on top of that, it's not just like flying over Florida where say, I'm just gonna climb to 2000 feet and I'm gonna fly straight over the entire state. You have within a very short span, 3,700, 5,200, and actually even if you went back to the farther right here a little bit or farther east, you'd be up around 9,000 foot mountain ranges. And you're then, or you're offshore. So the typical general aviation pilot can get boxed in on this coastline very easily when that fog rolls in. So great story for you here. As a new aircraft commander in the Coast Guard, now mind you, been flying for quite some time at this point, as we were tasked with, a tra I'm gonna say it again, a training flight down here in the actual Humboldt Bay. So beautiful day, 10 miles and clear, right down there. I mean, late afternoon, gorgeous. And we were checking ATIS uh, probably every 15, 20 minutes out of habit for that region. And it was 10 and clear, 10 and clear, 10 and clear. Here's a funny one. We were facing south the other time. So my nose, my aircraft was this way for the entire flight while we we're doing our training. Uh, and we we're doing hoisting and hoisting in the bay, working with a boat. And unbeknownst to us, as we got towards the end of the flight, we had a fog bank roll in uh, just offshore of the field. All right. And look, and we got down and we said, all right, you know what, we're going to push down deeper into our deeper into our fuel reserves than we typically do. We still didn't exceed anything on our on our FAA or our US Coast Guard reserves, but we got we got down there because we were getting really good training. It was one of those rare, beautiful days, and we said, let's do it. All the entire crew agreed, and we got down. Well, lo and behold, when we turned that corner, we decided we departed and we took off and started coming back up. This fog bank had shifted over the field to the point where it was sitting right here. So we talked about prevailing, correct? So while the eastern edge of the field was probably was clear, our route of flight was entirely boxed in with fog and it was a 200 foot ceiling with about two miles of visibility. So what did we do? What should we, what should we have done? Well, your uh, your genius instructor here today. We said, "What's we'll request a special VFR? We'll request special VFR." And we called Seattle Center, and because this is an, a class E at the surface, so there's no tower, but it's still a controlled airport when the field is I, especially when the field's IFR. We called Seattle Center and said, "Hey, we're seven miles south of the field. Request special VFR arrival. We're currently maintaining via VMC conditions." And they said, "Roger that. Uh, you are number." Four for entry. We have four aircraft coming in on the approach. Now, mind you, we talked about this already, but this airspace, this entire airspace is closed, right? A one aircraft can go in or out at a time. This is also a non-radar environment. So air traffic control is going to depend on the pilots of the other aircraft, in this case, United Airlines, regionals, and FedEx cargo aircraft to, to tell them when they land or when they're in a safe position to land. Or what if they're not and they go missed? So we're sitting here low fuel, low fuel, about to punch into an IFR environment, special VFR because we can maintain visual, and we're number four in line for aircraft that are coming in here, from here to here. So 
little commentaries for those of you who are still paying attention. What's some other things we could have done that have been smart? Right off the top of my head, I can tell you for a fact. Who cares about fuel? I had an airport right here, Murray Fields, doesn't have jet fuel, but it's a nice clear, it's a nice, it was a nice clear field with a place that with a nice ramp to park. And you also had Samoa Fields right here, a nice place to park. And if I really wanted to stretch it, I said, you know what, this is bad. And I just made the decision early. We could have gone up to Neyland, which was always out of the fog. It's at almost 3,000 feet. And there's a Cal Fire base there with a runway and jet fuel. But what did we decide as a crew? And as me as my young, my young pilot in command, well, we're going to sit here and wait. Well, what did air traffic control here? Oh, there was no emergency and your fuel was fine. So they said, okay, guys, you're number four. Well, guess what happened after three passed? We got another phone, we got another call on the radio from Seattle Center saying, hey guys, like four is a little bit slowed up. Um, and I got another aircraft coming, they gotta get in fast. Uh, they're, they've been delayed for a while, they need to go in too. Now I'm back to an even bigger corner. And guess what happened, guess what I had to request? One of my most embarrassing times for absolutely no reason whatsoever, I called Seattle Center and said, cannot comply minimum fuel. Well, thankfully that controller was very forgiving and they actually said, you know what? No problem at all. We'll get you guys, you guys stay offshore and just get in on the Western end of the field. I go, yep. So they actually gapped us in there. We, we kind of put them in a situation too, where they had to almost deviate from their normalcy. And thankfully United Airlines pilots and the FedEx pilots that were also coming in, were also very patient with us and understood what was going on and said, yeah, we can slow back. And they let us in. But why did I put myself in that situation? I still beat myself up. I could have landed here and said, you know, we're just going to wait out the fog, or I can maybe see if I can get a fuel truck to come down, or I can go up to here had I made that decision earlier. And I want you guys to keep that in mind. Make a decision sooner rather than later. All right, clean this up real quick. And I want to give you another scenario. And this is one of the, my biggest reasons why when Jeremy asked me to teach this class, I really wanted to have a discussion tonight about running the scud and this is where this is one of the capstone discussions so another event search and rescue case up in big lagoon california up here not a very long flight but you fly over some pretty uh some pretty wicked terrain 3,000 foot peaks here by the way the airfield's 220 feet so you're hitting 3,000 feet here or you can go offshore into which is typically always a fog bank fly around a head that sits about a thousand feet above the water and then try to cut yourself back in through, uh, through some ridges and other major large points that go 300, 400 feet out of the water. So we had a SAR case, uh, a family of four got swept, uh, three of the four family members were swept out to sea uh, during, a king, during some high seas, uh, pretty gnarly case. And that, if I recall right, it was 400 foot ceilings, two miles visibility. You know, the typical, our, you'll hear that trend a lot with that and it was visibility was dropping. So we called, we got in the aircraft, fired it right up. We do this route all the time. And we know, we know this, we have a radar on border aircraft. There's two pilots. Um, we have radar altimeters. We have, we have, uh, oop, uh, sorry about that. My computer just glitched there for a second. We have low visibility pre-established routes and points set here to keep us safe. So we can fly by GPS offshore. We have the right equipment for flying offshore. So we said, you know what, we requested special VFR from Seattle Center as, res as Coast Guard rescue helicopter number, number, blah, blah, blah. And we took off into that, into that fall, into that low, uh, those low clouds. And we just said, you know what, we're going to hit 300 feet and we're just going to go. As we came through here, actually, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to bring this around. So we came out here and as we rounded Trinidad head, we weren't quite sure where exactly they said big lagoon, but this is kind of like you, a little arbitrary because the reporting source didn't necessarily know where they were. As we turned this corner, we nearly had a midair collision with a Cessna 152 flying at 150 feet, uh, again, uh, going the opposite direction, going southbound in the same weather conditions, heading for Arcata, heading back to the airport. No calls on the radio, no transmissions, not talking to approach either because we had both frequencies up. So after having to maneuver and dodge them and make sure we could dodge them, uh, it wasn't near midair, but it was, it was very close. We get up, we do our SAR case up in this area 
The weather was bad enough, by the way, that I got vertigo during the case and had to transfer the controls to the other pilot because I lost visual a few times trying to keep an eye on the surface and also make it make tight, uh, tight turns trying to find the people washed out in the surf. And coming back upon landing, who did we see at the at the general aviation ramp at Arcata? That same Cessna 152. What was this guy thinking? Special, he, he wasn't even special VFR. He was knowingly flying in IFR conditions without talking to anybody. And I will go back to this. I think about when I'm very angry. The other pilot was very angry, but I go back to my time and I say, well, when I was a civilian, when I was flying civilian pilot, little Cessna 150s and Piper Cherokee and 172s, I never requested special VFR ever in my time. And I flew into all kinds of class G airports, obviously uncontrolled, so it doesn't apply. But I, I go back and I started to think of myself, what I've been prepared to, like, or what I've been like this guy, and I would have no clue what I'd be asking for. I probably wouldn't have even gone to that airport. I would have tried to gone somewhere else or try to climb or go some other way, not having a proper plan. All right, clear this up one more time here. All right. And now let's go with another situation where we had the plan. So another scenario, another search and rescue case. And uh, if you got the entire search and rescue case, I apologize, but they, they help justify making weather decisions sometimes more than just saying going out for a training flight. So with that, we departed off of our, we launched on a SAR case. This time the weather, I remember this one pretty well because it was 604 and I'm sorry, it was 400 and, uh, 404 and we could see offshore and knowing that the field is 200 feet above the water, we said, you know what, we can, that gives us about a 600 foot buffer. So we'll fly four, 300 to 400 feet um, under what's called uh, going out in the SAR case because it was offshore and it was up uh, well north about 70 miles. And we briefed that and we also said, hey, you know what, this weather is a little bit bad. We don't know what's around Trinidad head because there was no, there's no weather reporting between here for that 70 miles up to Crescent City. So we made a, we made a pretty, uh, we made a decision before we even took off. We said, we're gonna request special VFR to get out fast. We will not go below 300 feet and we will not go any slower than 75 knots, which for our aircraft is our typically right around our VY speed. Um, Sure enough, we took off. We didn't get three miles off the airport and we started finding clouds like you and believe down around the 200 foot range. So what did we do? We maintained VMC. We called Seattle Center. We got our approach. We got, an, uh, we got a, a clear, we got a clearance on the fly and then initiated a, cl initiated a climb up into the IFR environment and then shot an approach into Crest City Airport and then executed the search and rescue case. A lot of planning went into that beforehand and it was also done with two pilots and we were, I will tell you this, we were using every resource we had in that aircraft. You want to talk about cockpit and crew resource management. We had our, uh, we had our EFBs going. I had my, e uh, I was flying, the other pilot had his EFB going. I was focused on the instruments. The uh, flight mech was, was, was backing up on the GPS and all our, all our inputs on it. So a lot of work there. And now put yourself in trying to do this in a 1960s Cessna 172 by yourself with a paper sectional or maybe a paper ELA or your own EFB and you have a directional gyro that precesses like you wouldn't believe. Things to think about. All right, next two more scenarios and I promise we'll get through this for you guys. All right, here, now we're in Jacksonville, Florida. And like I said, a little beautiful, I'll give you some guys some beautiful beach weather here. So in this area, we, in this unit I was in, we do a lot of our training down at, in the vicinity of Reynolds Air Park down here. Uh, we were stationed up here at this airport, which is Cecil Field, former alternate shuttle landing site. Beautiful area, lots of, uh, lots of fun. Um, but it's prone to, like everything in Florida, the, the afternoon thunderstorms. With that, on one particular day, we were doing a training flight, just a training flight, mind you. Uh, took off. Prior to takeoff, we looked at the weather and we knew there was uh, rain showers coming and that was going to bring weather down probably below, uh, per the forecast, below, um, uh, below VMC, VFR conditions, more like high IFR, if you will. So, uh, you know, maybe three to four miles visibility, so your VMC, but ceilings right around 700 to 1,000. But we're in a helicopter and we thought, hey, well, you know, we know the plan, we know how to fly it. 
and we have all these airports around here with instrument approaches. So, hey, if we get a bind, we, let's do it. So for a training mission, we just went out and did our flight, had, had a lot of fun doing it, um, learned a lot. And sure enough, that weather system came from the west to the east with a fury, and it was worse than the forecast stated. But not in just the visibility way, but in the rain way, rain kind of way. So when we came flying back, we, uh, we, were, we were right here. We were anticipating because we, when we checked the METAR before, it was VMC. When we got to about here, that METAR went to a, spe a special METAR and became IMC. Coast Guard, Coast Guard helicopter, 6-5, whatever, field is IFR, state intentions. Okay, intentions are we're requesting a special VFR, and clearance, special VFR clearance into the airspace full stop. Coast Guard helicopter, 6-5, whatever, be advised, we have level four rain event coming on the field and we can't see, we can't, and the tower says just, we can't even see the runway and the tower is smack in the middle of the runways. All right, well, we can be, we had our Stratus in the back of the aircraft and our EFBs and radar. And we said, okay, well, we'll navigate around and try to get behind. We had plenty of fuel. So here we are, two very experienced pilots and a very experienced crew, crew member in the back, flying from here to go here, having to go all the way around here, and then trying to come back in through here, hoping the storms are gonna move by the time we go, burning down fuel all the way through. While meanwhile, having uh, air traffic control in the tower watching us on a special VFR clearance, tying up airspace. Ideal, fortunately, nobody else was really trying to come in at that time. But what could we have done? We could have gone, instead, we were right next to this airport. We could have landed, shut down, had a, had a Coke, whatever, gone back. We could have gone into St. Augustine, had full access to jet fuel, could have gone to Craig, could have gone to Jacksonville Navy, Navy Air Station, because we can do that. Um, but we chose to force our way home using special VFR. We chose to run the SCUD. Once again, was that the right, right situation? I, looking back, I obviously have some strong opinions about what that decision I, I participated in that day. But nonetheless, we made it. But we also had options we could have exercised that were probably better. And with that, another scenario, had the opportunity to do and this is one that speaks volumes. So especially my general aviation pilots out there on tonight, how valuable is free flight time to you? Uh, hopefully we'll get a couple of good snarky comments on that one, but imagine saying no to six hours of PIC turbine flight time. That was giving, going to be given to you for free. I made that choice just this year. Uh, I had a training event, uh, it's a training flight offshore right around this area with a ship. We we're going to do ship with uh, shipboard landings. And I was going to be training up another pilot uh, doing some instruction duties and qualifying them. And it takes about six hours to do all that. It's, it's a pretty intensive process. Well, that very day, it was already IFR conditions here. Uh, mind you, once again, it was in that high IFR, like that let's go stick our nose in it thing that some people tend to get in their heads. And we made and we knew we we're going out that it was only going to get worse by the forecast. And we were going to go, we made a decision. We were going to, we wanted to go fly out to, or the mission was to go fly out to a ship in the middle of this weather. Once again, start thinking about this. You start saying it out loud. How does it sound? Do training in this weather. And then the plan was after six hours of doing this to fly straight home back to Cecil Fields and shut down. Now, here's another twist. This airport, the, I, the ILS, the only instrument approach that actually gets you low in that airport for us at the time with our equipment was down for maintenance. I initially, so initially the plan was like all, any good, any good, you know, pilot trying to do his job for any company was out, we'll find a way to do this. So I did all of my flight planning. I met my other pilot and we were like, well, we could go, well, what if we took off? We can request special V and we can do tower to tower and then get out there or we can do something like that. And now we were always talking to somebody. It sounded really smart. But then we brought it to why are we doing this? And the answer was for training. Okay. But not for instrument training or anything like that. We No, we wanted to knowingly take off special VFR into an IFR environment to go train with a boat only to enter that IFR environment again and come back and and after being exhausted and fatigued. 
start seeing how that Swiss cheese model lines up. Now, not only are we using the maximum amount of our skill sets in the cockpit, but now we're going to be fighting fatigue. And you start opening up that I am safe checklist and we start falling down that line. You know, we're stressed out from doing uh, shipboard landings. We're tired, probably not that well fed. And now we're going to probably do this and probably at night too, by the way, because that's how it usually works. Coming back in special VFR. I said, no, I said, we're not going to do this mission. Uh, I, I said, the risk does not outweigh the gain of the training event. My bosses were initially not very happy with me. And they tried to talk me into it every which way they could. They said, well, what if you just shot an, an ILS into St. Augustine or into Jacksonville uh, Navy Jacks and you can and you can do special VFR from there to here. It'll just get you that much closer. It'll just get you that much closer. And I said, sir, you don't, sir, you don't understand. You're asking me to fly out in inclement weather conditions for the purpose of just doing training in a, with visual maneuvers just to come back in the same conditions, which are only going to get worse. How, what are we trying to do here? Um, Fortunately, cooler has prevailed and they backed me up. But, you know, in our in our culture, especially general aviation, is you, you younger pilots, you live for those 0.1s and those 1.0s, right? Everybody can count those hours. You know, you get your first 10 hours, you get your first solo, you get your first, you get your first 100 hours. Every hour is special for a long time. And still to this day, I have 3,000 hours and I still get all excited when I fly for two. Um, you don't let that be the only justification for you to go hop in that aircraft and go fly, especially in these conditions. All right, so strategies, and this is where we're gonna start wrapping it up a bit here, but top of the line here, guys, aviate, navigate, communicate. Make smart decisions when you start, make a, a good decision on the ground is a good decision in flight. A good decision in flight will get you into a good position on the ground. So fly the aircraft, um, or in the words of one of my more illustrious instructors in the military, fly the damn aircraft. Um, that is easiest way to easiest way to put it. If you make those, if you fly that aircraft and maintain control of it, focus your navigation, get on your communications. And here's another one. What about filing on? For those of you who can and are trained and qualified and have your instrument ratings and fly an instrument certified aircraft. If you ever have to fly in inclement weather for whatever reason, why not file an IFR flight plan? Just put it on there and then and then have, be, have it ready if you ever need it. When you go to take off or you go to, so when you go to take off, let's say, yeah, I think the weather's good enough for a special VFR departure and it's probably gonna be fine after, but just in case, why don't I put an IFR, I'll put an IFR clear, I'll put it, I'll file an IFR flight plan and then request a clearance. What's wrong with that? I've done this several times and it's paid off dividends because I transit into the instrument environment that much faster and I'm ready for it. And so is air traffic control is ready for me. Personal minimums, train, train, and train. Uh, that Purdue study, one of the biggest things that came out of it uh, was that all, virtually all the pilots who experienced inadvertent IMC or unanticipated IMC, as they're starting to say now, all said they had don't have enough training in it. They don't they don't think that they were ready for it and it got them in a bad situation. So find a friend that's an instructor, grab a plane, grab somebody, go do safety pilot duties with another friend and go practice your, go practice your BI skills. That it, um, those basic instrument skills are highly perishable and just making those navigational decisions are critical. I'm going to move down real quick. Set up your go, no go criteria. What are your personal weather limits? I don't care about VFR and IFR weather limits if you're you should have your own go no goes that says hey i am i know this is this but this is probably what i am willing to fly in i've been doing this for 20 years mine are still below what the mine are still i have lower i have lower limits or i guess you could say higher limits if you will than what the typical vfr flight requirements are it's 1003 i'm definitely questioning why i'm going out and flying my sticking my nose in this stuff uh, i'm going to jump down a little bit, you guys can read those other ones, big things. How many of you have ever, have ever actually done a divert outside of your flight training, a real divert? Like, hey, I can't go here, I'm gonna go here. Or how many of you just pushed your way to the, to the airport? Um, we talked about making a decision sooner rather than later. But then last thing, what are, your, what are your minimum speeds and minimum altitudes? I talked to you when we did that search and rescue case, we discussed doing, uh, we discussed it, that was smart one, was we say, hey, we're not gonna let ourselves fly any slower than this. We're not gonna let ourselves fly any lower than this. If that happens, we're going instruments. We're going on instruments. Set those limits for your aircraft and you. Uh, that may be in a Cessna, hey, I don't wanna fly less than 70 knots. If I have to keep slowing myself down to see right, maybe that's not the way to go. 
uh, you know, Paul and I were talking the other night and we, you know, 180 knots is you're doing three miles a minute. Do you want to be flying three miles a minute and three miles of visibility? What can you see? Where can you go? Um, and if all else fails, land the aircraft. And I am, I gave you an example of where I failed in that one. I could have put the aircraft at any number of airports. I could have done an, any number of things there, or I could just put it down in a field as a helicopter. How many of you, especially in the fixed wing community, ever said, you know what, mm, this isn't good. I'm going back and I'm landing where I can, where I can see visually. So that's, that's my brief as goes and great for some questions. But one real thing I want to bring up is my last thing I promised Jeremy and Paul. Uh, Jeremy's rubbing his eyes over there, so I feel bad. <laughs> am, I that am I that boring, guys? Am I that boring? Give me no, not more at all. stuff. All right, yeah, cool. Not at all. All right, why are we here? All right, these accidents, un unintended entry into instrument meteorological conditions, inadvertent entry into meteorological conditions. The top two killers, right, are the, of, of pilots. And why are we doing it? As I showed you in that earlier slide, 73% of the pilots knowingly took off in one study into those conditions. They knew what we were doing. We are killing our own industry and we're doing it to ourselves. This is not due to mechanical. This is not due to a lack of FAA regulation or due to a lack of uh, equipment or anything like that. This is purely bad decision making by us and the aviation community, and we need to do it. Similarly, what is this, what is this doing to us? We're losing pilots tenfold. Uh, the most recent study from the FAA as of like what, 2019? 8% decline annually in, in licensed pilots. That's not even active pilots, 8% decline. The only thing that's increased in pilot life is are instructor certifications. So we have more CFIs, but we're making fewer students. We're making fewer pilots. What is going on there? Same time, drones with a first licensing coming on, I believe in 2016, drone uh, remote pilot operator certificates have gone up almost double every single year. So we're actually creating a culture now where people do not want to fly in the airspace and your, your next generation of pilots would rather, fly, would rather fly something with a remote controller or be on a ground station. What does that, what does that turn into? Right now, who can, afford, who can really afford to go out and fly a plane whenever they want? Uh, you look at the rising insurance rates and aircraft costs. Uh, one article I read from Air Assurance before this meeting ended, which is actually where this photo came from here, is exactly was exactly on this issue. It is no longer a profitable venture for most for most insurance companies to insure aircraft. It's too risky for them. Why is this? It's not because the aircraft are breaking. It's because we are breaking them and killing ourselves in the process. So, folks, comes to when you make your choice to fly, make sure you have a plan and you know exactly what you're doing. Um, I can't I cannot stress it enough. This is our generation. This is our generation here. When Jeremy and I were flying in Daytona Beach, Florida, I was paying fifty dollars an hour for a Cessna one fifty two. I think I paid twenty five for an instructor. I saw one of those airplanes I used to fly flying right before I left Jacksonville, Florida. Looked it up. That same place now wants one hundred fifteen dollars an hour, and I think they were quoting sixty to seventy five dollars an hour for an instructor. Who can afford that? Are we, are we going to become a rich person's uh, enterprise or, or are we going to actually make this available for our next generation? Sorry, that's my, uh, that's my soapbox for there for a couple seconds, but I hope it hits the point home. And my probably my favorite quote of all time, I used to work in some safety jobs. You've let you all read that. And that is my presentation. I'm glad to take questions as they come. All right, Alex. It's great to catch up with you. It's great to have you on the show. And I'm honored to have you. Your wealth of experience and knowledge is incredible. And uh, I, I, I really appreciate getting to know you for the last, gosh, 18 years, however long it was ago that we met in the Barrington <laughs> laundry room. Yes. It's amazing who you meet in a dirty laundry room in the back of a dingy apartment complex at 10 o'clock at night. I would never have any idea that I would have ever gotten to the point where I could fly helicopters or be an army officer or anything like that. And I owe that to you. So one of the things that I want to ask, and I usually like to ask a lot of my guests this, is um, we talk about inadvertent IMC or unanticipated uh, IMC. Um, in general aviation, I can't really think of any type of situation where we should ever uh, enter 
to inadvertent IMC. Uh, some of the research that's out there has shown that the life expectancy for a VFR only pilot um, in, entering IMC has a life expectancy of 178 seconds. I don't know how accurate that number is, but that seems to be the buzz phrase, 178 seconds to live. So I asked um, quite a few people this question. Now I'm gonna ask you, what is your definition of a professional aviator? All right, yeah. Um, well, that's a, thanks a lot for that one. <laughs> so well, I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna give you one thing first I want you to think about, and then I want to go, and I did not come up with this. This is a, a, good, a good buddy of mine. Um, I won't name him because I didn't ask it for permission ahead of time. But is there such a thing as invert and IMC? or UIMC, if you will. Is that actually a real thing? Because guaranteed, typically speaking, when you take off from these flights, like this presentation showed, 73% of them knew what they were getting into when they, when they started it. So was it unintended or inadvertent or was that advertently done? Um, and now to segue over, let's talk about being a professional pilot. Um, I think professional pilot is a term we throw around a little too loosely with people that may have, uh, you know, you might be a far aim guru, or you may be a, a gold star, a gold CFI or whatever, you know, any of those things, you may be a, a airline captain or an aircraft commander in a, in a military service. Um, and you can say, Oh, you're a professional pilot or you wear epaulets and whatever those things are. You used to wear it. <laughs> you wear, uh, just kidding. But um, I think what would go as a professional pilot is, do you make the right decision at the right time? I, and I, I think that is that opens a window up where, you know, some of the best pilots I've ever flown with are the guys with 100 hours. You know, not because they're so they're they know everything going on in the aircraft and they know exactly, but they make really good decisions. And it's that um, it's that conservative, but. Uh, forceful decision, I think is, is so hard to find uh, people go. And we have a lot going against us as pilots. You know, the, it's an, it's, we're, we're an addiction worse than anything that's on the streets. You know, we love flying everything. Uh, none of us would fly. No, don't think anybody's ever forced into, I hope there's a comment on here. Maybe someone put me wrong, but no one's been forced to fly an aircraft. Right. Uh, so we all want to do this. We all want to be up in the air. It's where we'd rather be, but can you make a decision to say, Hmm, no, this is not a good time to do this. No, I'm not going to stick my nose in it. No, I'm not going to. Uh, no, I'm not going to take the extra risk to get the hundred dollar hamburger. I think that's a professional pilot. Awesome, that's a great answer. And I usually sum that answer up as doing the right thing when nobody's watching. And you, I like it. That's my definition. And Rod Machado's definition was having a code of ethics. It's not about making money. You can be a professional pilot as a student pilot or an ATP with 10,000 hours. I agree. Paul, you want to take the next one? Yeah. So I actually, um, so th this is, uh, it's a question, but uh, I'm not going to count it as a question because we've got a real one after that. But somebody had asked what the outcome of the SAR mission in Big Lagoon was. Uh, okay. It was bad. It was, it was bad? bad? Okay. It, uh, it, still sits, it still sits with me. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a, uh, Somebody else had asked, uh, did I hear you say that you must be an IFR rated pilot to request special VFR? I thought it was only for night special VFR. That so, yeah, and I, I apologize. I was running through that. I was I jumped over quick, but yes, read the regulation. 91157 gives you a, uh, a term. Uh, one of my great, uh, a great mentor of mine always says, uh, you know, the regulations are there to both help you and hang you. And it's all, it's all about the amount of rope you want to give yourself in this one. So yeah, I said, read the regulations, make sure you have it right. There's, there's a lot of exceptions in there, you know, except for, or except for, or in case, in, unless. So make sure you really know that before you start saying, I'm going to go special VFR. Gotcha. And my personal opinion, don't go do it so you can go have some fun. I, I can't stress that one enough. So let's just say you did find yourself in a bad situation. Let's just say you did. And it, this doesn't have to be an inadvertent IMC. This can be any kind of bad situation. Um, what can you tell the viewers 
the first thing you need to do, if you ever find yourself in any kind of bad situation, IMC or loss of an engine uh, immediately after takeoff in a helicopter or an airplane. Make a decision. Don't, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty broad, but uh, do something. Um, don't freeze. Uh, you know, typically when you fly invert and when you encounter an invert and IMC and well, you know, I, I see some of the comments coming up there. Typically when it happens, um, the only, um, I tell you, I, I have actually encountered invert and IMC, but it's typically flying one of these very remote regions where there's no weather reporting and you turn a corner and there, you're going around the cliff somewhere and, you know, you have the weather changes like in Northern California where that is just a known phenomenon. So you just plan for it. Um, but similarly make a decision, just do something you, you, you see that cloud coming or you see that inclement weather coming. Don't wait for you. Don't wait and then say, Oh, what do I do now? Or what can I go turn, make a climb? Hey, make a descent or, Hey, you know, I'm going IFR now, or I'm going to call approach. Say, Hey guys, I can't, I cannot maintain VMC. I was shocked. I've used this. I've, I've had, uh, the pickup clearance, if you will, a number of times, and I've never had a problem from air traffic control never had a problem from air traffic control. They're always say, are you, they're like, Hey, can you maintain, they're like, can you maintain VMC? And the times I've said, yes, say, okay, stay right there if you can and let us know if you can't and we're going to get you, we'll, we're working on your clearance. Or I've said, nope, I cannot. And they say, cool, start climbing, climb to you're cleared to this altitude. Awesome. Um, but make a decision early and make it and do something, you know, engine out, don't freeze on the controls and say, what am I going to do? Hey, if it's you're right off a of takeoff and you're not in a straight line, hey, okay, start setting up for your best, start setting up for your best glide, and you know, start running your running your EP through your head. But get do something with that aircraft that's going to minimize your chance of death or injury. That's absolutely correct, and I agree with that. The big thing, though, I want to make sure that I express, and and this is this is something that I always like to push to everything, every student I have. The first thing is take a half a second. <gasps> Take a deep breath, assess, react, make a decision. Just like you said, fly the airplane first, navigate, then communicate. You can't go wrong with oh, that. And then man. make a decision. You just hit something really good, Jeremy. Just reminded me. Declaring an emergency. How many, and once again, people in the rooms here, in, in the room, uh, think about this. When have you, or if you ever have, or when would you? It's not as clear cut. And I will tell you, from my background, I have, I have routinely, routinely throughout my history, except for maybe the last five years, I will say I really screwed this up. I can't tell you how many times where I've been offered the opportunity to declare, hey, I'm, I'm in an emergency situation to air traffic control. And I said, nope, I think we're, you know, uh, I'm not, not declaring an emergency. We just have a, a malfunction up here or this is going on. And about five years ago, I started to say, you know what, I'm going to declare that emergency. I need, I want to get down. I want to get on the ground. And the help and the support I got from tower, from air traffic control, uh, from the ground personnel, whatever, I've had the fire trucks roll for me a few times, uh, is phenomenal. And you know what, guys, I'm still here with all my certificates and no problem. Right. And, it, but had I, you know, one time I had, I lost half of my, half of my equipment on my aircraft. I had a short and a, a short on a bus while I'm in the middle of a test flight. So aircrafts, aircraft wasn't airworthy to begin with. I'm certifying it to be airworthy and I lose half the systems in the aircraft, including my flight control, uh, my flight control stabilization. And uh, how am I, and I'm a single pilot, by the way, cause it's 65, you can fly a single pilot. Uh, I, I, what did I do? more on Alex here. I said, Hey, I'm going to file uh, Hey, uh, tower. I've got some, uh, air, I've got some issues in the aircraft request, uh, request full stop, request push back to the airport full stop. And tower said, uh, six, five, whatever. Um, you, are you having an emergency? And I, and I actually paused because here I am, I'm flying the aircraft, not well, but I'm flying it. And I said, yeah, you know what? I'm declaring an emergency. And he said, Roger that. And everybody on that and everybody that was flying, got quiet and I got immediate, I got immediate clearance to land. Uh, don't be afraid of the systems that are out there. And I, and I hope that's what we, I hope I, we discuss some of that with these tools and decision-making tonight. How many times have you had to fill out paperwork from declaring an emergency? I've filled out, I, I've declared an emergency five times in my aviation career. 
and had to fill out zip this much paperwork. I picked up the phone, called the air traffic control manager, had a conversation on the phone with the air traffic control manager and explained the situation. And they didn't require any paperwork. They were just glad that we had a successful outcome. So yep. the moral of the story is, if you need that priority handling and assistance, talk to ATC. They are there to help you. They are not there to hurt you. Absolutely. Yeah. I've never filed a piece of paperwork. Um, I've had a air traffic controller call my cell phone when I landed and say, are you okay? That's, that's the most of it. That's the most it's ever gone. Cool. Do we have time for one more question or do you want to wrap it up here? I think we got time for a couple more questions. We can go to, uh, we'll close it out by nine o'clock. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so next question. Um, so you said special VFR is pretty much made for getting in and out of controlled airspaces, right? Uh, so as an IFR pilot, I can tell you, I've never honestly, uh, uh, filed a special VFR, but what would be like the ideal, let, let's say for a VFR only pilot, right? Uh, trying to get out of, let's say class Charlie airspace. What, what would you like, would it be VFR outside of that? Or uh, what, what are the requirements, I guess? So, kind of clarify for younger so This is personal opinion only, all right? Yeah. Uh, so I don't, because I, I don't want anyone to go out and say, well, Alex said this or Alex said that, because it's it's up to you. Ultimately, you're a pilot and commander of your aircraft, and it's your decision to use the tools afforded to you. But with that said, what when you request special VFR, there's it's a, it's a myriad of reasons why you could or cannot. Like I said, maybe it's because you can't climb up to the climb up because of, of weather above you, uh, you know, icing conditions. Maybe there's, uh, in my personal thing, I like to know where I'm going. Like if I'm, and now right now I fly a technologically advanced aircraft, but if I was flying a Cessna 172, where am I going to? Why am I taking off in this reduced visibility or this reduced ceiling environment? And I will tell you, and everyone here should probably agree, it's, it's, there's an amazing difference between between 910 being an IFR, which is an IFR situation, or being 110, or vice versa, it's very different being 1,001 versus 1,002. Um, so you have to really know, what am I flying myself into here? Am I gonna, am I, is my intent to fly out of the, uh, fly out of that weather into better weather, or am I gonna be flying, or am I knowing I'm gonna be flying continually into this? And just because you're leaving controlled surface area, going into an uncontrolled class G environment, well, guess what? You're going, are you going to stay that altitude? What is your plan? So if you're seeing ceilings and visibilities throughout that whole route of flight, why are you doing this? You are in effect scud running for the sake of scud running. Um, you know, this goes back into the old, uh, some of the older ads when I was a young pilot, which were, were all the instructors were like, hey, let's go find the sucker hole, right? where you see that nice, you see this really thick cloudy sky, well, I'll get special VFR, and then I'm gonna go climb up through and I'll, we'll get out on top. What are you climbing to? Where are you going? How do you know where you're going to is gonna have another hole? Where, back to, what is your decision-making here? And once again, why are you doing it? Uh, are you doing it for a mission? Or are you doing it for training? Are you doing it for a hundred dollar hamburger? Why, why are we flying? Why are you doing that flight? And I think that is something where you as a pilot need to really assess your conditions, knowing full well that you, you, we all want to fly and you need to make that determination of, well, what is this flight worth? And, you know, as a, you know, flying a Cessna or an aircraft, remember too, you're probably a single pilot many times. So are you, can, do you think right now, if you could hop, and I'm asking everybody that's still on here, the 140 participants, do you think you could hop in an aircraft right now, start it up, take off, and then make a hard left turn or hard right turn and then start climbing up and get a clearance, you know, and start flying IFR? What would your cockpit resource management look like? And you know, yes, I'm using, a, I'm using that term on purpose because I want you all to look it up. But what are you doing to make, what are you doing or what do you have to do to do that? Flying with two pilots, they're, uh, they're I mean, all, most of my pilots I fly, they're all ATPs. And we, it's a challenge to go, I, to go IFR, even flying in a, in a dual pilot aircraft and making sure you're hitting all your wickets and everything else. And then factor on, well, what's your aircraft equipment look like? Do you have, a, do you have an actual GP, IFR GPS? Is it updated? When's the last time you had, you made sure your VOR was intolerance? Your VR receiver is intolerant. I mean, these are all things that like you start peeling back this lay these layers and it it's a Swiss cheese ball can line up very, very quick. Very good. 
So, Alex, you and I have been put into some situations in the military where we've had to take off. If we didn't take off, um, soldiers or someone uh, on the ground was going to die. Our decision to take off was greatly weighed by the purpose of taking off. In general aviation, can you think of, and I'm not talking about a lifeguard 135 operation where you're transplanting a heart from one airport to an airport where there's a hospital or something where someone's in trouble. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in general aviation, part 91, recreationally fine. Can you think of any type of situation where a person can justify taking off with that type of risk assessment or risk management value? Yeah. Sorry, I, I saw I saw Ryan or Paul's comment there about the barbecue for a minute. I was yeah, just laughing. Sorry, sorry yeah, Ryan. Nice, I, nice. I had to answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, good. All of a sudden, this hour and a half brief has just gone down the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I. That's p- kind of my point. Um, honestly, Jeremy, I don't know. I. I. This is where it's like I really look back on my history as an aviator, and I really start to question myself and some decisions I've made to be honest with you and saying, yeah, I can fly in that. Yeah, I can fly in that. Um, and it goes back to that, that quote on that last page is of, of this, of this slide presentation, you know, superior aviators do not use their superior skill. You should have this superior judgment to not have to use their superior skills in a bad, in a superiorly bad situation. Like, how are we, you know, what are we trying to espouse, especially those of us in the instructing world? Um, and those of us in the, on the senior, more senior pilot side of the world, what, what model are we trying to show our, uh, are we trying to show our future generation of pilots? If they see us going out and being like, mm, yeah, we're going to stick our nose in it and we'll, we'll climb up above it if worst case, well, they're going to do the same thing. And we're proving even with all of the technology we have in our aircraft to this day, that's still getting people killed. You know, it, it should be a surprise to anybody that we're seeing a decline in pilots, an increase in you, drone ops. But now you're also starting to see, you know, non-TSO avionics being allowed into certified aircraft. You're starting to see auto land systems being tested and put into the put into the aircraft. That's not because we're doing such a great job as as a pilot community. This is we're putting ourselves in some really bad situations and industry is starting to come around to it. And even our, even FAA is, I mean, is really looking at it. All right. You've got one more time for one more question. Paul, you want to take the next question? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so you, you had brought up uh, diverting uh, to a different airport, right? So, I mean, you're on an eye for a flight plan and this. So I was actually reading somebody's uh, Facebook poster last week um and they they were on i think they're still on right now uh but uh, what happened with it is they were having some instrument problems and uh they diverted and they wound up landing in an airport where they were having pancakes uh like like Perfect. literally a breakfast of pan yeah so the guy had like the best time in the world eating pancakes at a surprise stop right because he was having some issues um at what to what level would you in your professional opinion and all the hours that you've been flying uh, would you divert? Like, I mean, if if it's, if your option starts to dwindle, is it better just to put it on the ground at, at, at an airport, just kind of give us some time? What are your recommendations on that for newer pilots? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, and I'll so we'll we'll vector this more towards uh, you know part ninety one, the part ninety one young uh, younger private pilot on for this type of question. Uh, yeah, divert. Yeah, have a plan to divert and divert often if you feel like you get in, if you put yourself in those situations. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, one of the beauties of flying in America is we have the most diverse airport network in the world. Uh, use it. You never know where you're going to land at. You never know what you're going to find there. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, thank, thanks. Oh, hey, it's, man, it's Ryan. Uh, <laughs> I like it. Um, yes. The, uh, yeah, that's by the way, that's a future pilot in the making, by the way. He's a really good friend of mine, one of my best friends. Um, so... Yeah, why are, yeah, diverting is, is there. It's nothing illegal about it. There's nothing wrong. It's, it's just smart. And yeah, maybe you don't get your airplane rental back on time to the, play, to the flight school you're renting from. Maybe you have to spend the night at a motel, at a sleazy Motel 6 in the backside of Arkansas. Yes, it's a very overly specific 
thing because it did happen to me. Uh, um, but it's, yeah, it's there. Use it. And it's not hard. Turn. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask one more question before I hand it off to you to issue out your closing comments. And you can kind of uh, give your closing comments at the end of this question. This question is, is uh, you know, obviously you have your CFR requirements on maintaining currency. Uh, you got to do six uh, instrument approaches every six months, holding, tracking, all of that sort of stuff. What is the difference between um, legally current and proficient in your, hmm. in your mind? Uh, well, I can give you this one really well. I shared a minimum of uh, 12, 12 instrument approaches every six months, part of my requirements. And I still think twice before I fly IFR. And I, uh, and I, once again, that's me flying technologically advanced aircraft with two pilots. Yes. Can I do it? But how comfortable are you in the system? And that's really, uh, as I, I say comfortable, but not conf overconfident, right? There's that, there's that fine line there. Um, yeah. Proficiency is one of those things. And how do you know, like, how are you, uh, are you continue, consistently making a right decision? Are you finding your, uh, no, no, I wish I had one of my, my, I have some friends of mine in the, in the Coast Guard that are really big in the research, uh, research side of safety and human factors. And, you know, they talk about your cognitive capability, like your, uh, your, your cognitive bucket, um, where you go up basically like, are you using all of your capacity, your brain, or are you just, where are you? If you find yourself able to like chew gum, talk on the radio, fly the aircraft and execute that procedure and no problem at all. You're probably in a proficient line. Um, however, if you find yourself like, Hey, this is a challenge. I have to really focus on that ADI or I really have to watch that mag compass or I, Hey, I, I tend to deviate on my altitudes or, you know, I'm not really quite sure how to dial up. You know, I know how to dial up in that Garmin 530, but I don't, I'm not quite comfortable with it. Or if I have to make a route out on the fly, you're not proficient. You may be prepared, but you're not proficient. So that's the time it's like you grab and you don't have to grab another instructor, grab a friend, go out when the weather's good and train for this stuff, train, train and train. The, that's one of the coolest requirements we have as a safety pilot is a safety pilot. go up there, grab one of these, grab a, a checklist and shove it under your ball cap, grab, buy a pair of foggles. Um, I even got a buddy right now. Uh, I think it was it companies like Icarus or something like that. that's making a digital foggle. So they can actually simulate you going in inadvertent IMC. Like there is no reason why you, you shouldn't be able to go grab a, grab a plane with a buddy and practice this stuff and make it a really good training flight and then go get a hundred dollar hamburger. All right, Alex, I appreciate it. Last word before I close this out. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Um, you know, I, I just can't stress it enough. Uh, I love aviation. This is one of the most, um, I think it was like one of the coolest communities we ever have. You could ever be, you could be ever be involved in, you know, we put ourselves in front of way more scrutiny than almost any other industry, including doctors and nurses and all that stuff. And we, we hold ourselves to very high stand. We hold ourselves to high standards. And from that though, we need to really start taking care of each other where when, when I mean that, I don't mean like, oh, let's cover up each other's tracks. What I'm saying is we need to make ourselves a better community and a community that's more open to more involvement. Uh, I, I it just, it blew my mind while I was working on this presentation. That's why I added at the end about how many pilots we're losing a year. And it's not to like old age. It's, we are literally losing pilots. Um, there's going to be, there's going to be a tipping point where aviation is going to, I think we're almost already there where it's becoming a boutique industry and I really that really bothers me because I know at 17 years old you know 17 year old 18 year old Alex I was waiting tables to scrounge up the money for the $30 become a pilot flight and I don't know how many people remember those that become a pilot program is 30 bucks you got a half hour on a flight and a half hour ground um, you know that same $30 flight is now a $200 is now a $200 intro in a lot of schools who's gonna who what are we doing to our industry? Light sport has failed us in that in regards and that it didn't make a cheaper industry. Um, 
how do we keep encouraging aviation and, and manage the costs? And I think that's on all of us, especially thank, for all you guys who take the time on a Tuesday night to sit here is get out there, find a, let's make better decisions. Let's get more people up in the air and let's prove our industry is what is, is as good as it is. All right, thanks Alex. I really appreciate your, your awesome feedback tonight. I thank you for bringing your experience to the table. I thank you for your friendship. All right, so those of you who joined us tonight, thank you for joining us. Uh, in closing, um, if you are registered in this webcast, I do not need to have you uh, send me this code. This code 2367 is for uh, viewers on YouTube who go and watch this program or those who missed it and get my regular emails. So from this point forward, um, as far as wings credit goes, if you are actually in this webcast, I can, I can do a buck bulk upload and get you your wings credit. It took me a little bit of time to figure out how to do the buck bulk upload, um, process with the FAA's, uh, wings program system, but I figured it out now. And that's why there was a little bit of a delay with the Rod Machado presentation, but now I got it figured out and you'll have your wings credit issued out as early as tomorrow afternoon. Um, if you have any questions, send me an email at flyallamerican at gmail.com. And if you are watching this presentation um, after the fact, send me an email, at that number there, 2367, and I'll issue out the wings credit. Uh, again, this is a YouTube channel that uh, I have, All American Aviation. It, uh, uh, it supports the mission. Uh, the, the mission is not the channel. The, the YouTube channel supports the mission by getting the word out to help uh, do our part um, to make pilots safer. Uh, look me up on YouTube. Give me a subscribe if you feel up to it. I'm on Instagram and on Facebook. This presentation is being broadcast live on All American Aviation on Facebook right now. So join us. Oh, one little thing, one important thing to point out. Two weeks from tonight is election night. Number one, go vote. And number two, we are not having a break in the chain on that night. We are going to have break in the chain the night prior, which is a Monday, a little bit of an anomaly, but just to let everybody know, Monday, November 2nd at 7.30 p.m., we will have our guest speaker, John, from uh, uh, Fly 8 Mike Alpha, and he's going to talk about aeronautical communication. So join us, get registered for that event, 7.30 p.m., November the 2nd, uh, Central Time. Uh, I'll leave you on this quote right here. Perfection is not attainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence by Vince Lombardi. Good evening, everybody. Fly safe, keep learning, and never give up on a dream. So long.